Welcome back to what may be the exclamation point of this incredible journey. It's our great pleasure uh, to welcome to the program Thomas Frank, of course, one of the most prescient authors of our times. But of course, for those of you who do read Thomas Frank, uh, it's pretty amazing to have him join us today. Um, some of the greatest insight into the American experience over the last two decades. I mean, my journey began with what's the matter with Kansas, all the way through Listen Liberal, and of course, the people know. Um, three, I would say, tent poles of what our effort is, uh, in addition to you know, this historical sort of moment, I think, which is happening on a on a day by day basis. But Thomas, I mean, you're in the in the middle of so many things, obviously, continuing to churn out editorials and and uh, podcasts. And it's really quite telling to see where your mind is in context to where you've come from. Can you give us some sort of, I don't know, perspective, if you will, on how you might frame, um, you know, priorities in terms of who, who and what the United States is at this moment? Oh my goodness, that's a that is a uh, that is a very large question, sir. <laughs> and uh, an opening one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's where we're going to start. Like, jeez, uh, uh, I would say um, that you know we're, we we've just come through the Trump presidency, and it's been a period of radicalization for a lot of people um, on both sides, by the way, I'm not just talking about um, liberals here, but, you know, uh, I've had, you know, all sorts of people that I that I know that were never really politicized uh, that, you know, that always thought that I that, that there was something like wrong with me for being so interested in politics. They've all they've all been politicized uh, by Trump, uh, usually by uh, the, the mechanism is by watching, you know, CNN or watching MSNBC or something like that. And uh, what's funny, though, is that for all of this political involvement, you know, we're all drawn to the kind of the culture war of the thing. And, you know, the other side is just so absolutely intolerable. And what they're doing is just so repellent and repugnant. And we can't believe this is happening. For all of that, the grand questions still seem to escape us. And what I'm referring to are, well, the grand question of, um, who owns this country and why why does the wealth can, can just i mean continues to get hoovered up into the uh, you know into the bank accounts of a very small number of people and this has continued and continued and continued and uh you know for all of our um politicization we just can't seem to see it or to understand it uh, and i don't i don't know what it's going to take to make that finally uh, dawn on people you know, uh, I mean, here we are, you know, and Patrick, I know that 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 that, that you, you started on this with your inquiry into the financial crisis. And I always say that for my generation, I always thought that was the that was going to be the biggest event of our lifetimes. That was so, you know, extraordinarily, you know, devastating for the entire world. But also it was an X-ray right through our society. It, it, you understood if you studied it, if you paid attention. Uh, you you uh, you immediately understood how things worked and why why things uh, unfolded the way that they did, and uh, uh, and I feel like those lessons are uh, forgotten or lost or were never learned uh, in the first place for so many people, you know, and they've been they've been obscured by you know the 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 the, the next disaster, which is Trumpism, or the disaster after that, you know, the COVID pandemic. Uh, and anyhow, so the, I, I always start with, on a, I like to get these things going on a real happy note like that. You know, <laughs> real, I really want people to smile, you know, at the start of this. Success. <laughs> we're, we're all going to dive in here. This is, this is more of a freestyle effort because we all have our come froms in this process, but you tapped into something that is extremely important that we're trying to germinate to the, 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 the audience, the viewing public, because what we have done is in the effort of, of course, our mutual uh, friendship with William K. Black, who I find to be kind of the, uh, um, the centerpiece of our efforts uh, when we learned about control fraud, which for us is a very paint by the numbers understanding of yeah, how it's an eye opening thing when you when you figure that out that, <laughs> that bankers loot their own companies. It's like, oh my god, amazing! Suddenly, suddenly it all makes sense. <laughs> suddenly I get it. <laughs> you know, 
I mean, it, it's it's the missing logical piece uh, for understanding the financial crisis and for understanding so many other things. And people resist getting it. They they have trouble getting it, although it's not a difficult <laughs> it's not a difficult concept. But I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Well, but, 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 but I mean, that's exactly where I was hoping you might take it, because ultimately, I mean, from our perspective, when you start to learn about deregulation, desupervision and decriminalization, when you understand each of those parameters and how that frames what we're living in, I mean, we certainly understand how we have interpreted that from the ground up. We've built the evidence from the ground up and what we consider um, the crime of the century. I think HBO might stand to uh, uh, confront us based on their uh, beautiful work with Alex Gibney, of course, in the opioid crisis. But please. Yes. No, I, I'm sorry. I, I was about to. Th- that's uh, good that you mentioned that. Yeah. But well, I mean, uh, uh, I, the, but the, the opioid crisis, I, I forgot to list that in my list of, of these incredible <laughs> disasters. Uh, you know, um, all of these things have a, there's a certain theme uniting all of these things. And that is the sort of status of the professional elite. And Bill Black always talks about the corruption of the prof- well. You just mentioned it yourself. Uh, uh, you know the uh, uh, desupervision, deregula- deregulation, control fraud. These are all pathologies of professionalism of the sort of white collar elite. Uh, they get the rules rolled back on them. Um, they uh, uh, you know they they stop supervising one another, or, or they're bought off in some ways. And we've seen this uh, first came to my attention with the Enron fiasco, um, which was right. <laughs> right before the Iraq war fiasco, but it's just, you see, it's just one after another (laughs) of these things. And, uh, but the Enron people had six and Bill talks about this a lot. The Enron people had successfully uh, figured out a way to buy off their accountants. Do you remember this? So that their accountants wouldn't get them in trouble for all of the incredible fraud that they were engaged in. And that was a real lesson. That was a kind of an eye opener and uh, the first sort of uh, what the overture to the financial crisis. But since then, I see the same pattern all the time of um, and then. The, oh, and then, of course, the, the, one, the most important sort of aspect of this is, is in, the, in the aftermath of the financial crisis when nobody gets held accountable. That's the part that, you know, that's the part that will forever blow people's minds that, you know, uh, these guys who are obviously engaged in, um, you know, selling fraudulent financial instruments, obviously engaged in, in a ripoff of enormous um, proportions that these people, no, they, they weren't held accountable. Not only were they, they were bailed out, they didn't even get fired. They didn't lose their jobs. They're, those guys are still there today as, as we're conducting this interview. And for, for me and for my generation, that was the real eye-opening moment that there was not going to be any accountability for these people. Now, there's, a, there's all kinds of accountability for ordinary people. You know, you step out of line in the slightest way. I was just, I was just looking at somebody who's been compiling all this footage of the police. You know, well, I, you think about the the cops. They, they killed that guy uh, in 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 Minnesota. You know, in, in broad daylight for some you know petty crime. And they they do this kind of thing. I mean, they they don't kill people all the time, but they are forever uh, busting people for incredibly pe- petty. Offenses. Uh, there's all of these, these, this YouTube, uh, sorry, uh, footage on Twitter of police arresting people for like drinking beer on the beach. It's like, what are right. beaches for, right? But this kind of thing happens all the time. And uh, but these guys at the top, no, there's no accountability for them, and that is fascinating. And it led in that that failure to hold these people accountable, led by in in uh, both direct ways and indirect ways to Trump and to Trumpism. You know, Trump, it's hard to believe now. I'm sure you've got the footage, Patrick, but in fact, I'm pretty sure you do. In fact, I'm pretty sure that it was your documentary is where I saw it of, of Trump promising again and again and again, you know, railing against the financial crisis and against these guys who, who faced no accountability. And this is Trump himself is like, oh, my God, you talk about, a you know, a crooked dealer, you know, a crooked real estate guy. But here he is criticizing other white collar guys for being crooked. And, 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 it, and it, it, you know, it's in a lot of ways, it's like, uh, what's his face in England? Who's the prime minister of England now? Come on. Boris you know, Johnson. Yeah, Boris Johnson claiming to be against the elite. <laughs> you know, anyway. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's a joke. It's, it's a, it's, and the, and the joke is on us, you know, who, who fall for this stuff, you know, but, but, Here's the thing. So there's been this kind of behind all of these battles, there's been this culture war about the the um, 
status and position of the white collar elite. You know, the, these battles going back and forth. And it was especially uh, uh, these battles were out in the open in t- 2016 after Brexit happened and after Trump got elected, where the, the white collar elite really felt themselves to be under siege. But their answer wasn't to say, well, you know, we've made all these mistakes over the years. We've made, you know, we've we've given bad advice. Uh, we've committed crimes. You know, we've, we've tanked the global economy, got us into a wrongful war, blah, blah, blah you know, prescribed uh, these addictive drugs that killed people, you know, handed them out like candy. You know, we did all that. No, no. They said the problem is that the public has lost their mind. The public has gone insane. And they came up with a word for this. It's a word that's very familiar to me because I come from Kansas. The word is populism. And they decided that that's the word that you use to describe this kind of public insolence, you know, this insolence of ordinary people rising up against rightful elites, the rightful elites, of course, being they themselves. And this was what, this was the sort of text behind all the battles of the Trump years. This is the text, you know, the subtext or however you want to put it. This is the real sort of uh, 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 battle. And they, they, they looked at Donald Trump and they saw the, you know, the negation of everything they believed in. He's such a fool. He's a blowhard. He's a liar, uh, you know, and uh, uh, doesn't, doesn't respect science, doesn't, res- well, doesn't respect anything. And, um, and so instead of having a real debate about this issue, you know, which you have tried to, to lead us through that, through that real discussion of that issue, instead we had this stupid <laughs> war over Trump, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and uh, nothing ever really did get resolved. But isn't that sort of like the point? I mean, it seems to me that the culture wars are used to distract divide and get us talking about anything except for why the person yes. who's our, my natural ally is 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 for some superficial reason my enemy and then and then then we never talk about the stuff yes so, that, so, that's that's so, the whole idea of the in my opinion that's what the culture wars are all about that's that's the what's the matter with kansas theory and um you know i, I wrote that book in 2002 2003 I did it after I was I lived in Chicago at the time and uh, Kansas had 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 uh, they'd had a big debate there over the theory of evolution. I'm from Kansas City originally, and I I couldn't believe that, that my home state had been like debating the theory of evolution. And I was like, what the hell, you know, in the year 2002. And and uh, I couldn't believe it. And so I had to go there and. um, you know, and, and find out and get to the bottom of it. And what I eventually decided was, but what, exa- what you just said, exactly. Uh, but, but, you know, the culture wars, why do they succeed? Why are they so attractive to people? Why do we, we love them? You know, we can't wait to fire up Twitter in the morning and see what the new culture <laughs> war is going to be, you know, and it's uh, for a lot of people that, well, for the, the sort of the, the cultural battles that have been most successful for the right, all of them uh, speak to people's um, feelings of, uh, uh, h- how do you put this? Of, well, they, they speak to, to social class is what it is. They speak to their feelings of, of, of being left behind, uh, of being disrespected, uh, having an elite that, that tells you what to do. You know, these are all very uh, sort of standard issue, uh, blue, you know, the feelings of blue collar people. And but they take those those are very normal feelings because that is in fact how blue collar life is right you you are bossed around by somebody else usually somebody with a college degree and uh, you know and they tell you what to do and they themselves are able to I mean this is the sort of the nature this is the difference between blue collar and white collar uh, employment and uh, they tell you what to do and you do it and uh, but the, uh, there's a traditional way of expressing that. I mean, really, really normal anger, and that is through sort of uh, traditional left politics or traditional liberal politics, which we had for a long time in this country. And then there's this other sort of phony way, which is through the culture wars, where you are supposed to get angry about the liberal elite because they look down on your values, et cetera. Et cetera. We all know the story. And but it's a way of 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 channeling class anger in a different direction. And the more I looked into this. Every single culture war battle did this, every single one or every single one that was successful. I mean, 
they, we try out, I don't know, 10 culture war, you know, uh, new culture war sort of uh, uh, attacks every month in this country, but only one or two of them will stick, you know, and those are always the ones that, that tend to speak most um, eloquently or perversely or however you want to put it to this sense of grievance that people have. And the result is that it becomes very difficult for us to talk about things that we should be aggrieved about. The financial crisis, Jesus Christ, these guys just wrecked the entire world. You know, instead, we get hijacked and sidetracked by these uh, these these crazy side issues that take us nowhere. Uh, you know, and just they just serve to get us to get us angry, but but they never achieve anything like getting angry at Hollywood. You know, I, look, I, I I have a you know. I've criticized Hollywood movies. I have a lot of problems with Hollywood movies, but I also understand that that's not what politics is about. You know, why do we fall for it every time, though? It's fun. The culture wars are fun. It's like it's like entertainment. I mean, why did we? Fruit. Yeah, and why did we elect a guy, a TV star? You know, Donald Trump. Why did we elect a TV star to be president? You know, it's it's it is it is the sort of logic of entertainment taking over our entire lives. And, and, you know, this is the thing about, about um, control fraud, Wall Street, financial crisis. It is slightly difficult to understand. I remember when, I, when this happened, you know, when the financial crisis broke in 08, I was a columnist at the Wall Street Journal, no less. I actually was that. That was my job. And um, I tried, I was like, wow, you know, I better understand this. I better, you know, go from zero to 60 real, real fast here. That's actually how I happened to meet Bill Black is, uh, you know, because nobody knew what, uh, what are the, I forgot what it, what it stands for now, CDS. Oh, the uh, credit default oh, right. Credit default swaps, right? Nobody knew what they were. And everybody was saying, oh, this is the next thing on the horizon. You know, AIG is in big trouble. They've been issuing these credit default swaps. And I'm like, what is that? And, and, and I couldn't find it in anywhere. You know, I was looking around. I couldn't find any stories about it. And I started calling experts and they were all like, I don't know, but you know, this guy, Bill Black, he knows. And so I wound up calling Bill Black and he in fact did know what they were. And it was, uh, that was the beginning of my sort of uh, friendship with him. And, uh, but it, it wasn't easy to figure that stuff out. And that's, of course, that's part of the point of it is, is the, the opaqueness, the opaqueness is, is a huge part of it. And it's not just the opaqueness. Do you remember I wrote about this in, in Listen Liberal? The complexity of it is actually seen as a virtue by a lot of people, uh, by specifically by other members of the professional elite, specifically even to be even more specific, specifically by, by liberals, uh, the sort of um, wing of the Democratic Party that, um, that sort of controls the party's presidential nomination. Meritocracy. Those, yeah, the, they, they see that as a sign of... of, of uh, you're a highly educated person. Uh, you are. You have merit. You, you're able to design these things of incredible complexity. Complexity is admirable in and of itself. And it always reminds me that Bill Black said, "What you know, in his days as a prosecutor, when we saw undue complexity, that was a red flag. It's like, aha, let's let's look a little deeper. But with Obama and company, when they saw complexity, they're like, oh, that's that's awesome. That's <laughs> that's what you want. <laughs> you know, it's exactly the wrong." The wrong message. Unfortunately, I mean, we just had this. Um, we just went through this this time in our national life where we, where we should have debated these questions openly and we should have talked openly about the role of the elite. I mean, the public was at mad as hell. I mean, rightfully mad as hell in the in the in the aftermath of the financial crisis, uh, the opioid epidemic, uh, you know, the Iraq War. These are all cases of of elite bungling. And uh, the public and, and deindustrialization. I mean, my God, this is all remember managed by the the Clinton economic team. They tell us that these these trade agreements are going to uh, they're going to increase employment in America, not hollow out uh, the interior of the country. And then when that is in fact what happens, they they turn around and blame the people who live in those places and say, well, you're just you know you didn't go to college or something like that. You know you're <laughs> you know you know how they did victim blaming. Blame the victims. People have a perfect right to be furious about this stuff and to look at the white collar elites in this country and 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 uh, and be absolutely furious. And I'll say this: I'll go even one step further. 
people who want to be part of the white collar elite are furious also because they're discovering now that to, to, to become part of that is extremely expensive. Universities have become, you know, they've raised their tuition now more or less constantly since the early 1980s. And it's no longer affordable. I mean, when my dad went to college in the 1940s, it was either free or really, really, really close to free. And now it's, um, uh, you know, I went to the University of Chicago for graduate school. Uh, it costs that that school costs over 80 grand a year to go. Nobody can afford that. I mean, the very rich can afford that, but ordinary people simply can't. And uh, they're, you know, the ruination that this has brought down on a generation of young people who were told that this is the only way to get ahead in American life. This is the only way to be a part a middle class, you know, part of the middle class. And uh, then look, look what happens. Then they're saddled with a lifetime of student debt. And I'm not joking about that. I get emails from people in this situation all the time. I got one the other day from not from a student who had taken out student loans. It was from parents who had taken out student loans, and they're going to die with those student loans. I mean, they're in their 60s, and there is no solution for them. And the student loans are, the interest rate is insane, And but they had to do it. You know, the, pres the president, everybody was telling them, your kid will not, will, your kid will go nowhere unless they go to, uh, you know, fancy school. And, uh, uh, and if you can't afford it, you can take out the student loans, and we're going to make sure that everything works for you. And it's, you know, these people who, thought they could be members of that white collar group are now they're screwed. This is uh, it is ruination across the board for a lot of Americans. Uh, and uh, and yes, we need to have a, uh, a society wide reckoning on all of these questions. And instead, we got Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, let me jump in real quick. So, you know, you started this thing out talking about who owns America. And, you know, this this brought me back to a couple centuries ago, ironically, with Napoleon Bonaparte and how he had realized that, you know, one of the things that the elites hated about the revolution was that it did away with class, it did away with nobility and so forth. And what we've seen uh, in speaking with people like Michael Hudson and others who talk about a new neo-feudalism, we're seeing the elites find their nobility once again through this elite control fraud and through these kind of financial arrangements that are only accessible to a very, very small number of people. Yeah. And it, it's almost like a stealth move to bring about a form of nobility yeah. through financial I, 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 transactions. This is uh, uh, came out last year, two years ago, the meritocracy trap uh, was by a professor at Yale. And he, he is, uh, you can see from my post-it notes, <laughs> <laughs> I got a little involved <laughs> in it. It, it was a, it, it's it has it has a, a few things wrong with it, but overall he is really hitting it. And um, but he argues that that we're basically um, we have created a um, I don't know if I would call it feudal, but it is uh, uh, we have created a, an aristocracy that is passed yes by blood uh, because uh, you know it, it, it's so difficult to get into these schools. You have to be you have to know exactly what to do, and only people who've been to these so. Step back here. Uh, the you know we can talk about the industries that control America. We all know what they are. When ten years ago it was all um, Wall Street. Today Wall Street has ceded a, a couple of the spots to Silicon Valley. So it's those two industries, and they both draw on the same pool of talent and and the same uh, handful of universities. And I'm by handful I mean five. Wow, literally yeah. a handful. Yeah, or maybe six. You know, but but uh, not not very many. And anybody outside of anybody that that and it is it is literally graduates of those universities. That's who they choose. And um, they're very open about this. This is not a secret. And if you're if you're not one of those people, that, if you didn't go to one of those universities that you can you can forget about being a part of this of this ruling elite. OK, so then we say, well, those those universities, we all know they are, uh, you know, it, careers are, as Napoleon said, careers are open to talent. You know, the, the, they, they choose the best and the brightest. And so, they're, you know, no problem, right? Because the best and the brightest, it changes all the time. Actually, that's not the case. It's very easy to, not easy, but it can be done. You can game entrance into these things, uh, into these, these schools. It's not hard to do, but it is expensive to do. And you have to know how to do it. And uh, this also is, is, is fairly well known. And the, the, the parents who went to these schools are able to do that for their kids. And so you do see, uh, dynastic wealth 
returning in this country. And the fact that we've basically more or less done away with the estate tax, uh, you know, and so many other forms of, 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 uh, of uh, well, that's, that's a wealth tax, but uh, income tax uh, in this country uh, have, have made that, uh, you know, have accentuated that. And so what you're seeing is a kind of uh, what we imagine to be meritocracy is, in fact, a kind of dynastic nobility. That is exactly Correct. And this is emerging right now. And it, if it doesn't frighten you, then you're, you know, you're not paying attention. It, it is, it is really, really, really scary. Uh, can I uh, change the subject slightly here? Sure. And by the way, I'm open to talking about whatever you guys want to talk about. So feel free to interrupt me. Okay. But one of the things that, that was most interesting during the Trump years, like I say, the sort of, um, the Uber debate, the, uh, the underlying debate that you had all through the Trump years was about the place of white collar elites in our society. And, uh, you know, they were very offended by the rise of Trump. And they said, you know, Trump, Trumpism is worship of, of stupidity, you know, et cetera. They called it populism, et cetera. We, we all know that. And then in the last year of Trump's presidency, you had the, uh, the COVID pandemic. And during COVID, the, all these people who'd been saying things like, you know, putting up yard signs saying respect science, you know, in this house, we believe science is real, all this kind of thing. They suddenly got their wish. And suddenly science was elevated once again to the top rank. And science was, uh, we all, was, you know, we all put on face masks. I'm, you know, still wearing mine whenever I go out in public. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, we, we, and, and we, we all did we, what, what, they, what they wanted. And it was this very curious, um, it was like, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, they got their way. And uh, anyhow, uh, do you see where I'm going with it? Well, maybe you don't yeah. see what. Well, no, no, I do. I want you to touch upon that uh, because I think it's extremely important to get into how science may have made a, a major faux pas or flub or however you're going to characterize it. Because yes. unfortunately, that gives fuel to the fire that which you just postulated was actually what the elites had been uh, looking down, sneering at for the past. Um, exactly. Years. Exactly. And, and by the way, I mean, I, I, I should probably mention at some point here because your, your viewers are, are watching this and, and, and I'm, I'm very familiar with this phenomenon. Now they, they, they hear what I'm saying and they're like, Oh my God, he's some kind of Trump supporter. I'm not. Okay. I'm really far to the left. I voted for Bernie Sanders <laughs> twice in the primaries. I voted for Clinton in 16. I voted for Biden. I am a Democrat. I'm a very liberal Democrat. I am by no means a Trump supporter. However, and just two months ago, I was scolding a member of my family, a, a Trump voting member of my family who was going on about the, um, the, the, the Wuhan lab, you know, and I was saying, you know, that is not, that's not right. That's a conspiracy theory. You know, the, the, everybody knows it's a conspiracy theory. It's been debunked. I've read about it, uh, you know, and, and then I pick up one day, I open up the website of the bulletin of the atomic scientists and read this incredibly detailed uh, article by a former New York Times science reporter, uh, basically saying that the lab leak hypothesis is the most likely explanation of the of wow. the COVID ex of of the right. COVID uh, pandemic, and I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, and everything for me fell into place immediately. Uh, suddenly, I could see because this fits the same the pattern that we've been describing. Once you start reading about the details of this these echoes of the financial crisis start coming back. You mentioned de-supervision. <laughs> I, I mean, this is no laughing matter. I shouldn't, I shouldn't chuckle like that. But, you, you know, deregulation, de-supervision. Oh, my God. These are a bunch of guys fooling around. And who was it that used to call um, uh, these, these financial instruments weapons of mass destruction? Was that, was that Warren, Warren Buffett? Warren Buffett. And what these guys were, what the, 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 this, uh, this article, I had never heard the term gain of function research before, but it's a kind of, of uh, research that a lot of these sort of top level laboratories, virology labs do with viruses to make them more um, virulent, to make them more infectious to humans in order to study them. They, it, it's considered legitimate research, but it's also known to be very, very dangerous research. And the, um, the question has always been like, well, we're doing this really, really, really dangerous research that could easily cause a global pandemic. Uh, let's hope there's never a lab leak. Mm. And the, thing, the, the problem with that is lab leaks are uh, common. They happen all the time. They happen in the most secure laboratories all over the world. 
Uh, and there's a long, long, you can look this up. There's long, long lists of, of all the lab leaks that have happened uh, and people die from lab leaks all the time. And we know that the, uh, uh, that the, uh, the Institute in Wuhan, China, where the pandemic first began, we know that they were doing, that they were doing these exact kind of experiments with bat coronaviruses. And uh, it's totally, suddenly it becomes, you realize it becomes totally plausible that this, that this took place. And uh, you realize that, that, that you're seeing the exact same phenomenon as during the financial crisis. Two, two important aspects of that. First is groupthink. There's always, with these people, it's always groupthink. With all the, with all the bankers, uh, you remember what's Keynes' famous um, uh, uh, line about the honest banker? Patrick, I know you know this quote, I'm, where I'm, Keynes I'm, is saying the honest banker is 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 the, is not the one who sees the crisis coming and is willing to go out on a limb and say, "Oh my God, disaster is coming." The honest banker is the one that that does exactly what all the other bankers does. You know that that that's that that, that does groupthink, right? And that's what right. that's what has been going on in our response to the pandemic. Everybody was saying, oh, "You know, it, no, it, let's circle the wagons. It couldn't have been this." To say that is a, a conspiracy theory, and it's again, whistleblowers are. Uh, not just ignored uh, in this case, but we have a new phenomenon that didn't exist during the uh, financial crisis days, which is social media. Social mm. media was was actually censoring people that talked about the lab leak hypothesis up until about a month ago. Actually, you'd put something up on YouTube or on Facebook or on Twitter, and they would they would take it down. Yep, and uh, that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, well, and and they're doing that because they were assured by whoever the experts were, that this could not possibly have happened. And this was a crazy theory, um, that this was some kind of right-wing conspiracy theory. And therefore, you know, it, you, we shouldn't even tolerate conversations about it. Now, what if they had done that to you, Patrick, when you were making this, when you were making your, your series? What if they had done that to uh, me when I was at the Wall Street Journal writing about the financial crisis, when any of us were trying to investigate it? You know, and they had just said, no, 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 there's nothing to see here. This was a remember what they used to say. Who could have known? Who could have right. known? <laughs> it was a perfect storm. Right, right. <laughs> what if they'd had that tool in their toolbox at the time? They didn't. Right. We were able to eventually uh, it took years, but we were able to get to the largely get to the bottom of it. You know, thanks to all of the sort of investigation that was done. Um, you know, a, a curious reader now can uh can can read the, the various books about it and can can figure it out but but uh that's because these 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 forces like mark zuckerberg with the big red but mute button <laughs> it didn't exist at the time or existed but no it wasn't important at the time you know he didn't have the kind of power to just shut down conversations See, that he has yeah. now well, I'm, I'm reminded of uh i'm reminded of uh Giannis Varoufakis recently has, has been to the world with this concept of techno feudalism, you know, and um, when you when you tie in the, the financial apparatus to the monopolization apparatus to the communication apparatus, you know, it it, it co joins those into this revelation of what you're talking about. It's something so significant as COVID. But I want to frame this for you um, to further the dialogue from our perspective. So you ask the question, what if you know people couldn't hear what you're saying? Right. And I'm reminded immediately of uh, Bill Black over decades of trying to let people understand what control fraud actually is once you get past the threshold of it being slightly complicated. But hopefully we were able to in the time make it uh, such that everybody could follow the bouncing ball, quite frankly. That's right. But, but you're exactly right. He was not he was not listened to when it would have made a difference right. when the when the Obama people came in. So the Bush people, there's you have no hope for those guys. That is. That is control fraud as 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 like a, a strategy of governance. <laughs> you know, it's the wrecking crew, right? And uh, you know, deliberately appointing people to run the uh, oversight uh, administrations that that are that are not interested in oversight. You know, it's, it's desupervision in action. Okay, so he's 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 useless. Uh, here comes Obama. Obama seems like a breath of fresh air. Obama seems to get it. Obama even filmed a campaign commercial featuring Bill Black, as we all know. Uh, where he's talking about the um, uh, uh, what's the scandal in the eighties? Um, Savings and loans. The Keating Five. Yep. 
And do you remember that? Because John McCain, who is Obama's yeah. opponent, had been a member of the Keating, had been one of the Keating five. Right. And uh, so they film a TV commercial with Bill Black. And I assumed when I saw that commercial and they did eventually run that commercial, I assumed that that meant that that Bill Black was going to be moving to Washington to be <laughs> part of the new administration in 2009. That never happened. <laughs> and. Yeah. Uh, and it took it took years for him to get his message out uh, and to get people to listen to it. And it's still not widely um, understood. Well, but I want to carry that to why I think that you were so incredibly valuable to the nation writ large based on where you have come from in your arc from, you know, what's the matter with Kansas all the way through the people know, because really populism has this misnomer with this elite uh, culture to put us into camps that have been uh, very well, quite frankly, I'll borrow from Pink Floyd, you know, it's either us or them, right? And so in the end, for me, what we were able to configure, and and it just boggles my mind when I think of gatekeepers, when I think of people who don't understand the continuum, is that, you know, they might think a specific element of, of, of any of these specific stories that we're referencing uh, as something that might be historical or dated. No, it's con continuation because it never ends. There's just a different virus that enables it to continue in the manner that we're talking about. So when we were able to go from predatory lending through the woman, Addie Polk, through the collapsed uh, working class, um, you know, with, with the collapsed, I mean, we destroyed the golden goose and everything that you referenced. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When, I think, when I think back to populism in your book, especially the people know, and to where we are today, um, I, I can't think of a more important uh, sort of understanding from where you come from. But I think what we're lost in is this insane fragmentation of the marketplace so we're trying desperately, like you mentioned previously, to get the dialogue on the things that seemingly are out of reach into a way that the mainstream or most of us, both on either sides of this coin, can c come to the understanding that we're all getting played. How do we move that into a populist movement? Oh, my God. Patrick, that's like eight questions, not one. OK, <laughs> <laughs> but let's 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 first let's start with what the words what the words mean and what they what they might mean. If you if you wanted to have a hopeful outlook about things, the, the, the all of this, this the attacks on populism, what I call anti very. Forthright, I think, straightforwardly anti populism, all of this reaction against uh, populism, all of these people denouncing populism as a form of insolence as a form of like militant stupidity, right? That's what they, that's what they think populism is. And um, that's, of course, that's, that's not what it is, but there, it's also in, in a sense, it, it does clue us into the, to the real debate, which is uh, elites feel that they are threatened, that their prerogatives and their status and all that sort of thing are threatened by ordinary Americans uh, who are, who, who have no reason to complain that this is all, um, this is all groundless anxiety. My point is these people have a perfect right to explain, A, B, uh, um, er, explain. These people have a perfect right to complain. They're entitled to their grievances. Their grievance are, grievances are extremely rational, okay? B, this is a democracy. The people rule. I mean, we are, America is a democracy, and it's, it's not just a democracy. It's, you guys know this. It's the most democratic country in the world in terms of manners and culture. It's the most egalitarian, anti-elitist culture in the world. Uh, there's nobody that even comes close to us, in my opinion. Um, democracy is who we are. And if you're going to say, if you're, you know, if your uh, political, um, you know, if your party of the left is based on a contempt for ordinary people, you're going to have terrible problems. And the, the third point is this. For the, the, the country that I was born into and that you guys are about my same age, that we were all born into in, in, in that country, the, it, we, you know, you look back at the, like the speeches of Lyndon Johnson or something like that. We understood what uh, the Democrats, the Democratic Party, which was the dominant party in those days, understood what the economy was about and what the mission of government was about. And it was to extend the middle class standard of living to more and more and more Americans all the time, widen the circle of prosperity make it more a democratic prosperity. That's what it was about. And this was, they, they did this because the, you know, they came from a populist heritage. They understood that the, you know, that the people's uh, general, you know, their, their economic longings and their, um, you know, the, the people had the right idea. They may not always express it correctly. They may not be right a uh, hundred percent of the time about every detail, 
but in their desire to lead a, you know, to have a middle class standard of living, the people were right. There was a famous book in the 1930s that I take my title from, The People, Yes, the Celebration of Ordinary Americans. I mean, that's what the 1930s was all about in this country. That's what the Roosevelt administration was all about. The people, yes. Uh, and you would, uh, you know, the idea was you would, uh, you would, you would control Wall Street. You would, um, you would bring the financial system and the economic system generally under control in order to guarantee prosperity to the largest number of ordinary Americans that you possibly could. That was the whole idea. That's what it was all about. And then at some point we have, uh, but you know, you look at uh, at the at the the way the system is today, and we, our elites, even our liberal elites, even the ones in the Democratic Party, deeply mistrust the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the ordinary Americans, deeply distrust the populist impulse. Um, I want to say something about the actual populists, the people where the word came from. And they, you know, they were a left wing party of working class people, of farmers and, and, and uh, you know, industrial workers in the, in the 19th century. And they weren't contemptuous of science. They weren't contemptuous of higher learning. They themselves were not learned people. Obviously, they were, you know, farmers and workers. They would, you know, by and large had not gone to university, but they were very respectful of people who had. But they could also see that the sort of reigning economic theories of their days, which they talked about all the time in their, you know, local populist clubs, they knew what those theories were. Um, this is sort of classical economics, whereas the reigning economic theory of the time, they could see that those theories had no place for them and that those theories didn't have a, uh, you know, didn't allow for the prosperity of ordinary people. And so they demanded, you know, that even though they themselves were not economists, they were very, very, very interested in economic debates. And I think that is healthy, wholesome, healthy and wholesome. And the populace had a way of thinking about um, intellectual disputes that it would be, I think it would be healthy for us to rediscover today, which is you have to be able to explain your um, highbrow intellectual ideas to ordinary people if, you know, if you want them to debate these things. And this is a democracy by definition. They have to understand those things. Those people have to go out and vote for our politicians. That's what a democracy is. Therefore, you have to bring those ideas to, to ordinary people. And the populists not only believed in this, they did this. And they set up this enormous apparatus for bringing uh, these ideas to ordinary people and explaining them in a way that ordinary people could understand. Um, that's what the Populist Party was all about. Well, today we don't um, we don't believe in that anymore. As I said, we worship at the shrine of science and we worship at the shrine of complexity, and we uh, you know we have basically made meritocracy and you know this white collar status into uh, inherited things, you know past almost by blood, it, it, we, we are 180 degrees the opposite of that. And so, yeah, these revolt open. You know, people are furious as they watch this way of life that they were brought up to expect, uh, as they watch that being taken away from them. They watch their community being destroyed by deindustrialization and opioids. And uh, yeah, here comes a demagogue, you know, to exploit that. That's what happens when you don't have a real party of the populist left, which the Democratic Party used to be, when that doesn't exist any longer. When you talked about the economics and, and the people not really understanding so much of what we're talking about with this elite control fraud and understanding people get chain. control fraud, you know, what, what, but they do get that. That's incredibly uh, an easy idea to get and a really attractive idea to get. The problem is that nobody ever talks about it, you know. And, and when I, I know when Bill Black would like explain it to the FBI, they'd be like, huh? You know, how can that be true? What, how could a banker want to issue bad loans? They don't they it doesn't compute, but it does too. Uh, I mean, like if I when I explain that to um, members of my family who don't know anything about economics, they get that. They get that instantly. They get that instantly. It's the easiest thing in the world. This is all predicated on watching. You'll, you'll notice the news comes out with stories about the Federal Reserve has bailed out so-and-so they they've quantitatively eased their way out of this problem the the new the latest emergency fund is supporting banks or supporting shadow banks or supporting anything other than we the people and so you know folks like myself who are in the modern monetary theory camp who have been working with uh advisors from 
Bernie Sanders campaign, like Stephanie Kelton and others, you know, we're, we're in the process of trying to explain that, hey, you know, that game Monopoly, you know, when you run out of money in Monopoly and you just write it on, pay, you know, the piece of it. <laughs> that's all we're doing here, too. The only difference is they've convinced you that they don't have a pen and paper to write when it comes to we the people. But yeah, as minute yeah, there's a the problem right. with the bomb, there's a minute there's a an oligarch that needs some sweetening. The money's there instantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that this perversion. Yeah, you're talking about this is the old, old, uh, uh, the deficit hawk. You uh, got it. Crap. You know, the, when the Republicans are out of power, they're always, I, I remember this from my childhood. Jimmy Carter was president <laughs> and Ronald Reagan is is coming up as, you know, radio commentator, complaining, complaining, complaining about, uh, about, uh, uh, you know, deficits and now they're spending money they don't have. And then, and then they get in power. What does he do? You remember? Reagan, like the biggest budget deficit of all time, <laughs> right. you know. But then, you know, for the military, right? They gotta, they gotta, they gotta pump up the Pentagon spending, and then, and then it happens again. And then they, you know, they complain bitterly about Bill Clinton, and he, they actually get him to balance the budget. Do you remember that? He he actually, was as good a Republican as any Republican he was, ever. He, was oh my God, he actually meant it. He was like, he didn't realize <laughs> that that was it was all a con. He had, he, you know, he thought it was on the level, and he went and did it. You know. He was a better Republican than they were. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then Bush gets back in and is like, uh, you know, hits the gas again, you know, standing on the accelerator. Oh, my God. Yeah, they love that game. They love doing that. Where you are we it. now? We have a Democrat in there. Are they doing it yet? Are they complain? Yes. Why? Yes, they are. Let's check your watch. Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, the, but the thing, though, is, is that it's this backstopping of the elite control fraud through extreme measures by the federal reserve with the blessing of congress and so forth that you watch that enabled all of this to happen that enabled them to without any kind of uh fallout without anybody being imprisoned without anything they, they literally have a zero risk backstop there yeah that that is part and parcel with their entire plan and, and, and the, the reason I want to take us back momentarily, I won't stay here, but back to the French Revolution again, the reason I even brought up the nobility part was if those nobles were found to have worked or to have invested or to have done anything other than just suck the money out of the, the free gifts of the population, right? Yeah, yeah. If, if they yeah. would have done it, they would have lost their nobility. And so they baked this thing in. To where they didn't I, I remember hearing they income. worked they were they worked pretty hard like standing around Louis's bed in the morning you know when he would wake up <laughs> what did they call that they had a chickens. name for that and then and then the <laughs> other ones who stood around his bed as he went to as he as he drifted off to sleep that was that was hard work Stephen. <laughs> well it seems to me i mean i think it was uh i think it's a kind of the point of uh piketty's uh capital right that that uh the uh, American and French revolutions were in response to the aristocracy, and instead of like rule by hereditary title, but uh, uh, rather rule of law. And so, it, it seems to me that you know the people who want to be aristocrats figured out that all they have to do is subvert the law. And the uh, and, and and the people who are responsible for carrying out um, the uh, you know carrying out those laws in order to regain their status as aristocrats. I mm -hmm. mean, is is, there, is it that simple? Well, not not always. I mean, there's a lot of things where we don't actually have the law, but there's also plenty of examples where you just need to en enforce the law. The one that I always talk about that it's now a hot subject here in Washington D.C is uh, antitrust. Uh, you know, the, the laws were passed in the 1890s. The laws, you know, out where we outlaw monopolies in the U.S., those laws were passed over 100 years ago. What happened is that in the 1980s, by the way, and once I mention this, you'll start seeing other examples of this, but in the 1980s, the sort of uh, legal community decided that, uh, that it wasn't a good idea. The ec law and economics community decided that it wasn't a good idea to enforce those laws anymore. Um, not to repeal them, the public would never stand for that, but uh, to just not enforce them anymore. And that the only time that monopoly mattered is if it actually you could it, you could show that that uh, you know all of these mergers were causing 
prices to go up to consumers, but that in no other way did, did it matter. And so therefore we can allow monopolies again in the United States. And that was, that was under Reagan and uh, all the administrations since then up to the present one, where there's a, uh, there's some question about all, all of the intervening administrations accepted that uh, Democrats as well as Republicans permitted that. And it, I always used to say when Obama was president, you know, do you remember towards the end of his time in office, they would always say, um, oh, there's nothing he can do. You know, you, you guys all you think he's the presidency has these magical powers, but no, the president doesn't have any power at all. There's nothing he can do to, uh, you know, to 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 make America more equal or, to you know, it's like, oh, all and I would I wrote this more than once. All he has to do is call the attorney general into his office and say, uh, we've decided to start enforcing antitrust again in America, <laughs> you know. Go right. get them. Go right. get those guys. And you can have a field day. And uh, uh, but but no, he, he never did that. Now, there's some there are hints that the Biden team might uh, start doing that. We'll see. I mean, they're, they, they haven't actually done anything yet, but there, there are hints that they might actually start enforcing it again. Wouldn't that be awesome? But once you realize that you start seeing that this is the case, there's all sorts of other examples of this where communities of uh, professionals, i.e. the same white collar elite that we've been talking about, they basically decide that uh, they, they arrive at a consensus among themselves that the law should be defined in a different way. And yeah, that, that's not what the public meant when the law was when the, the law was passed, et cetera, et cetera. But that doesn't really matter. We've decided that it really means uh, X, Y and Z. And so therefore, that's how we're going to enforce it from now on, uh, which is an incredible power to have. The, the, this is a, you know, totally outside of the demo, democratic process. But that's the way it goes. Well, I think it's an incredible way to end this dialogue because, you know, the, the purpose for us was to try to find that hopefully zeitgeist to inspire our audience to to further their knowledge. And, and I would encourage, please, everybody uh, to go to Thomas Frank's website to check out his offerings. I mean, what's the matter with Kansas? The people know, of course, listen, liberal. Those are just prescient works to make us understand what reality has been for decades now. And um, in that context, Thomas, you know, Eric had teed up for us before we even started this journey. I mean, he, you know, I was asking him to postulate really kind of a, a theme for what it was that he thought we were about to dive into. And he wrote um, an essay called The New Aristocracy. And I can't believe this many years later, quite frankly, that that's pretty much what we unpacked. Of course, Bill Black taking us to that, that point in, in, in your you know, your final point about, uh, you know, enforcement to us is really what it's all about, because this movement that we're trying to galvanize, we're trying to become a populist center of gravity to create a civil rights like movement to purge corruption. I give you the last word. It, they, well, uh, Eric would, was completely right about the new aristocracy. That is that is happening. That is that has come to pass. Uh, and we we definitely need some kind of reckoning with that here in the U.S. Um, and. Uh, how do you build a populist movement? Well, that's so Patrick, you ask the that is the sixty four dollar question that everybody all the historians who care about these things have tried to ask. There's a man called larry goodwin. he's he's dead now. He would be a, otherwise he'd be a perfect uh, guy to have on your show. But he wrote the classic history of the populist movement. It came out in the nineteen seventies. It was called Democratic Promise. And he got interested in populism when he in the nineteen sixties, when he had been a civil rights organizer in Texas, and he was, you know, doing this kind of organizing, and he learned that there had been this this movement, uh, whatever, eighty years before, that had done a lot of similar thing, and he'd never heard of pop you know, populism. He started looking into it. He got very interested in, it, and he wound up writing the authoritative history of it. Once he was done with that, then he um, he he wrote a bunch of theoretical stuff about how you build mass democratic movements of ordinary Americans for economic reform. How do you do that? Uh, it's very difficult. But there has been three really important examples in our in, in modern times that we know of. The populist movement in the 1890s, which was, uh, these are all transracial movements, by the way. The populists were a movement of farmers and workers uh, who obviously challenged Wall Street, challenged this sort of economic ruling class of the day. The uh, labor movement in the 1930s, which just was explosive, grew by these incredible leaps, did the same thing, but actually enjoyed quite a bit of success. The populists um, wound up losing. It took a long time for their reforms to happen. They did happen eventually, but they lost at, you know, at, at first. 
the uh, labor movement in the 1930s actually won. They won all kinds of enormous victories, and they basically pioneered the middle class society that that we all grew up in. And then the third example is, of course, the civil rights movement in the 1960s, which uh, was this very intensely populist movement, movement of ordinary people in the South, uh, going out and claiming their voting rights and doing this en masse. And, And it wasn't about leaders and it wasn't about experts. It was about ordinary citizens. And towards the end, you know, it was starting to turn into a movement that wanted to challenge economic oligarchy. This is Martin Luther King talked about this all the time. It was becoming that kind of movement. And that was his idea. That was his, he and Bayard Rustin, that was their grand idea was to transition from civil rights into economic rights. And then he was murdered, of course, and, and it never, the movement never really got there. But you have these three great upheavals in our history upheavals of ordinary people, transracial movements, demanding economic justice. How do, you call, how do you make that happen again? And this is, we've all been struggling with that. And everybody that, that, uh, you know, that learns these things struggles with that because they realize right away that this other model, the, the model that the Democratic Party has for reform, which is you know, put the elites in charge, put the, put the smart people in charge, and they'll figure it out for you, that that always fails. That model is what gives you the bailouts. That model is what gives you the, you know, the Obama administration, which, as I said at the start, looked real good when it first came in. But then look what happens when you let the when, when you just leave it in the hands of of the uh, of the professionals and the, you know, the lobbyists in Washington. This is always what they're going to do. OK, you have to have the mass populist movement if you really want to get results. You have to. There's no substitute for that. Well, how do you build it? It's incredibly difficult. Okay, that's it. I'll see you guys some other time. <laughs> that was your TED talk right there. That was it in a nutshell. <laughs> I know, but the problem is that nobody has the answer. No, nobody has no the answer. answer. <laughs> this is uh, Goodwin himself said. It's like it's like trying to climb a ladder while you're also building the ladder at the same time. It's extremely difficult to do, and uh, nobody really knows uh, how how. But but I, I'll tell you that one one thing that all three of those movements have in common is that they don't speak to people by saying, are you a liberal or are you a conservative? They organize people based on where they are in life, in reality. And they don't sneer at ordinary people. This is hugely important. You don't sneer at people. You organize people. You you, you talk to them in a way that resonates with, with how they actually live. So you're talking to farmers about farm problems. You're talking to workers about the workplace and about unemployment. You're talking to uh, black people in the South who aren't permitted to vote about their right to vote and then about their economic situation. And then you get all these white, you know, the white workers also uh, signing up and joining forces with you. That's how you do it. You talk to people about their lived reality. Uh, and that's where our modern day we can everybody can see that's where our modern day liberalism completely drops the ball because it's much more interested in scolding than it is in. Uh, speaking to ordinary citizens in a way that that means anything to them. So anyhow, we know we look, we can sit here and diagnose this and we can say what's wrong. But building a movement, man, that's hard. That's tough. We got to influence the influencers. And I'm hoping, you know, bringing people like yourself on who are so well connected and just so eloquent. You've got well, the you, hey, you're thinking of the other Thomas. Uh, I'm yeah, the one yeah. who's like, uh, my influence is like, <laughs> yeah, well, let me just say this. <laughs> Anybody that is aware of these things, chances are their influence is down like this because they're being pushed away from the yeah, spotlight. There's no interest. There's no interest in this stuff. None. Exactly. It's funny how vested our, our sort of political establishment is in the war between uh, good people and Trump, you know, the, the good guys and Trumpism. and you know, what we're talking about is something completely outside of that and something different from that. You know, it overlaps with that here and there, but something that is a a much larger uh, uh, story, right? And that's when you you try to tell that story and talk about those things, they just don't want to hear it anymore. They they want, they want, they want it to be this, this stupid little fight between them and the Trumpists. And uh, (laughs) yeah, exactly. Well, it's brilliantly stated, Thomas. And, and, you know, to close this up from my perspective, and I'll obviously, if anybody else wants to offer any final thoughts, but really, I think what Steve just said is so incredibly important because 
we do have to have nodes of allies. And I think that what you've demonstrated, I mean, we're nobodies. And yet here we are talking to somebody that we all admire is, is somebody who's a huge influence on, on what we've become. So thank you for that. Um, and I'll just say that we're just, we're, we're desperately trying to move the ball forward based on, and I'll, and I'll say it uh, probably for a fifth time in this conversation, I apologize to be redundant, but a civil rights-like movement to purge corruption because it's central you go. to everything you said. It's central to the problems of the plight of the South and gerrymandering. It's central to, you know, the, the white working class or just working class, you know, writ large. And it combines all of these and the confluence has got to be liberty and justice for all. Because if it's not that, what is it? It's yeah. everything you identify. You said it. That is exactly right. Thank you very much for your time. And this was fantastic.